Okay, so before I go into the actual neurons themselves, I wanted to mention these things called neural stem cells because they're kind of important clinically. So they're multipotent, not pluripotent, but rather multipotent. Um, a large abundance of them happen whenever you're a child, but by the time you reach an adult, you still have some neural stem cells. They reside in your hippocampus, and I don't really know exactly why um, they're just in the hippocampus and not in other parts of the body, but anyways, they can differentiate into astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and neurons. And so that's where I think a lot of the hypotheses are around whether or not these guys are all acting kind of in equilibrium at least. But I think with neurons being as uh, specified as they are, that differentiation pathway is probably going to be permanent. Um, we do have some neuroplasticity, but to go from a neuron to an astrocyte, probably not likely. But anyways, um, the reason why this is important is because if you have a lot of oxidative stress, um, and, and this is kind of interesting to me because cortisol, uh, I don't really know how or what determines whether or not something can pass through the blood-brain barrier. I assume because cortisol is fat-soluble that it can, but even then I wouldn't really understand what the systemic oxidative effects are of it. But if you have a state of anxiety where you have high levels of cortisol in your body, that inhibits neural stem cell um, production in your hippocampus. That inhibits their proliferation. That inhibits learning. So if you have a state of high anxiety, you're not able to learn, you're not able to form new memories, you're not able to, you know, going on. Um, so for neurons, these are the, you know, the main, I guess, workers of the nervous system in terms of actually sending signals and receiving signals, and they have really extreme longevity. Let's just think about this. This is really impressive to me. I mean, I know I mentioned earlier that they do a lot of things, but they're under a lot of oxidative stress, and they can live for a very long period of time. Um, if you're an 85-year-old person, that has 85-year-old neurons in their brain. That's amitotic. That means that they A without mitotic, mitosis, so they don't do cell division. You're pretty much born with you know, a finite amount, and you keep that finite amount for the rest of your life, with the exceptions of a few things. Very, very high metabolism, and it's only done via aerobic respiration. Okay, so the two things that the brain has to have in order to uh, do its job is oxygen and then glucose. So this is really important because if you're a diabetic, you know exactly why I'm stressing this. Because diabetics, when their blood sugar gets low, that's the same thing as not breathing. Okay, think about how long you could go without breathing. That's the same thing with them. So obviously only aerobic respiration. They can't do any type of fatty acid metabolism or any other you know, secondary uh, metabolic prof uh, pathways to make ATP. A lot of mitochondria. The body consists of a lot of things known as nisal bodies or nisal bodies. I don't really know. It's just neuroscience for rough endoplasmic reticulum. I don't know why the two fields have different uh, nomenclature, but also a lot of Golgi bodies, things that you would need for making proteins, um, neurotransmitters, and other things that you would be you know, associated with those processes. Microtubules, the cytoskeletal proteins, and then neurofibrils, which again, this is just another word for keratin filaments. Um, obviously keratin being like in your hair, a very strong protein there. Um, the microtubules for the vesicle uh, transport needed, and then uh, also for cell shape, but also the keratin filaments are very strong. They provide a lot of the cell shape because you want to have with these little processes here sticking out called dendrites, you want to have them sticking out like that and you want to have large surface area to maximize the amount of neurotransmitter absorption that you have. Okay, so as a byproduct of lysosomal activity, and I should mention that, that neurons have, in the body at least, um, you know, this area here, <clears throat> they have all of the cytoplasmic organelles of a regular cell. But what's interesting is they produce this thing called lipofuscin. I don't really know how you pronounce it. But it's a byproduct of lysosomal activity and it increases with aging. So I wonder if it's a good biomarker of just at least natural oxidative processes that are happening in the brain. Not necessarily clinically relevant, but something that can give us an indication of how old, quote unquote, someone's neurons are. And there's two types of processes. And a process in this context is just anything that's sticking out. So that could be a dendrite or that could be an axon. These are the dendrites here that I'm coloring in my pen here and I'll switch colors. This is the axon here. It's kind of ugly, I know. <clears throat> but anyways, it uses action potentials and synapses to send signals to other neurons or other target sites. For example, like whenever I wave my arm, you can't see me waving my arm, but whenever I wave my arm, there's uh, using those action potentials to send that signal from the nerve to the muscle. Okay, so dendrites, um, obviously, like I had mentioned previously, all these guys here, um, 
really receptive regions with massive amounts of surface area and it sends signals to the body of the cell. So from here to the body uh, via a graded potential. And I'm not gonna talk about what a graded potential is in this video. When I talk about synaptic transmission, we'll talk about what that means uh, at, at that point in time. For the axons, these long things here, um, they begin at this thing called the axon hillock, which I guess I could just draw right here. And I mean, it's it's a little cone-shaped thing, but for the most part, it's kind of a, you know, what's in a name, abstract point in the, of where just action potential begins to be generated. These can be up to three to five feet long. Yeah, so as you're sitting there listening to me talking about this, wiggle your big toe, okay? As you're wiggling your big toe, that is one long axon from your spine to your big toe. So yeah, very long, very you know stretched out thing. And they can sometimes split into other branches like we're seeing down here. We call these axon collaterals. It's still considered one axon though. Um, they don't have more than one axon. That's kind of uh, subjective nomenclature there. Um, <clears throat> split into terminals, uh, forming a synapse with dendrites. Um, these things here are called terminal buttons. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means when we get into the synaptic transmission. And then um, cytoskeletal proteins help transport things to and from the cell body. If we're transporting something to the cell body, uh, to here, okay, that's called retrograde. And if we're transporting something from the cell body, we call that anterograde. So for anterograde, the type of transport that you'd have would be things like your mitochondria, cytoskeleton, vesicles, and the enzymes that you need for neurotransmitter synthesis or neurotransmitter release. And then for retrograde, mostly just uh, growth factors or damaged organelles that you've had. So things that you would need to have for repair. And people, you know, we don't talk about this much, but, you know, it's an electrical current is what determines how neurons fire. And they're adapted to withstand that electrical current. But nevertheless, I mean, if I were to be electrocuted right now, there'd be a lot of damage to, you know, my skin and, and things like that. And so, you know, just even, even in structures like neurons, there's going to be some damage to them. And they're going to have to constantly undergo repair processes and, and restoring the, the plasma membrane, restoring the myelin and all that jazz. And this is just a picture at the very end that really kind of, collectively wraps up what we had talked about with um, the neurons. So here's the cell body. It has a nucleus, nucleolus, uh, you know, endomembrane system, microtubules, ribosome, everything like that. Here's a close-up of the synapse. Here we can see the microtubules. I think it also mentions that there's neurofibrils in there. I'm not really sure if they did. Neurotransmitters giving enough the reception. This is via synapse. We'll talk about synaptic transmission later. Um, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes. They didn't list them in there, but they're there. Um, <clears throat> And then at the actual axon, you can see the microfilaments involved in that anterograde and retrograde movement, and then the microtubules um, as well. Microtubules are more so involved with transportation. Microfilaments is more of a, um, a, a contractile protein that we haven't really talked about in the context of this, um, but just know that this is involved in moving things up and down this axon. Three types of neurons. There's unipolar, bipolar, and then multipolar. And these are all basically classified on their structure, and then that structure lends itself to the functional role that it has in the central nervous system. So multipolar neurons would be neurons that have greater than three processes. Remember, a process is just anything that extends outward from the cell body. Um, this consists of one axon, and then the rest would be dendrites. So the, the classical neuron that you've been seeing whenever you think of what a neuron is are multipolar neurons. And these plays a uh, role predominantly as interneurons relaying information. We'll talk about that when we talk about the spinal cord or, or the neuromuscular junction or other things like that. But just keep that in mind for now. The other two are actually really closely related. They're known as bipolar and unipolar. And this is all just relation to the number of processes extending from the body. So bipolar consists of two processes, an axon and a dendrite, extending from opposite sides. And it also has a role as a sensory uh, neuron. So this right here would be a bipolar uh, neuron. A unipolar is a single short process emerging from the cell body, and it's this. This is why they're, this is the part where they're saying that that makes it unipolar. They're sometimes called pseudo unipolar because they emerge during embryonic development from the similar uh, cell types as bipolar neurons. They have a similar differentiation pathway. Um, so if they have that you know much similarity, they both have the similar jobs to play, and that is that they're both acting as sensory. Now. And the one last thing that I want to mention is that this right here, this is not an interneuron, okay? This is an anexonic neuron. This has no axon, okay? And with these things, 
we don't really know much about them. We don't really know what they do at this point, if they have any job. They might just be vestigial structures, but that's probably unlikely. So keep that in mind.